Hi everyone. Um, this is the exam review session for chapters 7, 8, and 9. Um, and I'm going to go through things a little bit quickly because um, you've already been tested on this material, you've um, been reviewing it, you've uh, been thinking about it all semester long. So I'm going to hit some of the highlights uh, from the study guide um, and then um, talk a little bit about things that um, students tend to struggle with or I get a lot of questions about. Um, and then if you've got any questions at the end of this, please feel free to either email me or post them in the discussion forum for the exam review, um, and then we can all benefit from both your question um, and student answers and my answers as well. So, um, so chapter seven, um, we're talking uh, about middle childhood, um, cognitive development. And I've said this before, um, you can use the part about physical development as a good background, um, but I'm not gonna test you, unless it's on the study guide, I'm not gonna test you on physical development between early childhood and the beginning of late adulthood. Um, so, you know, good background, good information to have um, so that you can understand the whole child and not just cognitive development or just psychosocial development. Um, but uh, when it comes to things like um, weight and illnesses and those kinds of things, that's um, beyond the scope of this class. Um, we're going to focus on the psychology. Okay. Um, so. Um, Children are now in the concrete operational stage. Um, they're starting to think in a more matter-of-fact way. Um, they've got a lot of skills under their belt. Um, they can classify things. They can put things in order. You can put things into subordinate and superordinate categories. So um, they would be able to understand whether there are more um, bears or animals in a mixed group of animals. And they would be able to put things in order from smallest to largest. Um, so um, these are the skills that they're developing during the concrete operational stage um, where you saw in the pre-operational child where they didn't have conservation and they didn't have reversibility, they do now have those things. And so they can mentally reverse a task, understand how something happened um, and how to perhaps mentally undo it. Um, so um, that's what's going on cognitively from Piaget's perspective. Um, Vygotsky comes up in this chapter again. We talked about Vygotsky in chapter one, um, and then again in a later chapter. Um, the idea of guided participation, that children learn best when they are presented with materials, presented with challenges um, that they're not quite ready for, um, so that it challenges them to, um, to work on things and to think of things. Um, you don't want it to be too easy for them so that they'll get bored. You don't want it to be too difficult for them um, so that they'll um, you know, lose focus because they're overwhelmed. Um, but uh, if they're provided with a mentor, if they're provided with somebody who can provide what, uh, excuse me, PSA, uh, what Vygotsky called scaffolding, those temporary supports that will help the child move to the next level, um, that that's the best way that they can learn. So Vygotsky, um, very influential in educational psychology, um, how children learn best within that zone of proximal development of you know, things being just challenging enough, but not overwhelming um, and also not boring. Um, children can use selective attention at this stage, so um, they're understanding these are, um, this is related to that next item in the study guide, control processes. Um, they're able to um, understand that they can focus their attention on one thing and try and push other things out, where before when they were younger, it was sort of every shiny thing got their attention and they were, they were just learning and taking in so much information. They're still learning and taking in a lot of information, but they're now able to focus on things that they want to focus on or that they know that they need to focus on. Um, and exclude other things. So they can um, work on their math homework and not pay attention to kids, what kids around them are doing. Um, or hopefully, if this is a skill that they're developing, it's something that we all struggle with. Um, you know, I don't know where you study best, but um, I like to listen to music, but I can't listen to music with words because it's hard for me to, um, to uh, tune out the words and think about the thing that I'm reading. Um, so children are working on this at this stage. Um, metacognition, uh, like meta-memory or meta-awareness, uh, meta is that idea of being aware of the thing, uh, of the thing that you're talking about. So metacognition is not just cognitive development and, um, and thinking, but thinking about thinking. So children are starting to learn that there are certain study strategies that work for them. Um, there are ways to learn uh, vocabulary, if that's what they need to learn, or states and capitals, if that's what they need to learn, that there are different ways of learning things. Um, and some are more effective than others, and it depends on what it is that you're trying to learn, which strategy is gonna work the best for you. So um, those are the kinds of things that are developing during middle childhood. Um, with language development, their grammar is getting more complex, their, uh, their narratives are getting more complex, um, and they're also um, learning more about the pragmatics of language. So and we talked a little bit before about code switching, um, the idea that they understand that there's a way to talk to your friends and there's another way to talk to your teacher and perhaps yet another way to talk to your parents, 
um, and they're very fluid in, or, or they develop fluidity um, in their ability to switch back and forth so that they speak correctly in front of the people that they're speaking to. And they also know that it influences the outcome. Um, so, you know, speaking sharply to your parents is not going to be a super great strategy if what you want is for your parents to exceed your wishes. Um, so, um, so children are learning all of these things and they're learning um, how to use language for their benefit. They're learning how to use humor um, and when to use humor. So, you know, all of these things, they're, they are very busy people cognitively. Um, the uh, uh, bilingual education, um, so um, your book talks about this, the idea of there's bilingual education and um, ESL education. And in one case, um, children are being taught in both um, perhaps you know if it's if it's here, uh, it's probably in the English language and in another language. So they spend part of their day in one language, part of their day in another language, um, and they're learning both languages at the same time and, and progressing in both of them. Um, that's one strategy. Um, another strategy is to take all of the English language learners um, and teach them in an ESL classroom, an English as a second language classroom, um, and they may have uh, different native languages, but they all come together and try and learn English together. So um, it sort of depends on you know whether you're, you know there are benefits and drawbacks to both approaches um, so I just wanted you to be aware of what they were so that later in life or later in your careers um, if you're uh, asked to make a decision about that or to um, to sort of discuss that and influence it in some way um, that you'll know what those are um, ELLs are English language learners it's an abbreviation for English language learner um, DLL which is used less often and I think is not used in this book at all is a dual language learner um, children that are learning two languages at once um, the International Achievement Test, the Tims and the Pearls. Um, if, you're, if you live in Raleigh um, or in the Research Triangle area, um, Research Triangle Institute does some of the research um, or conducts some of the research, administers the tests, um, particularly, for, I, I know for the Pearls, I don't know about for the Tims, um, in the United States and they were doing it internationally as well. So if you're interested in social sciences research, um, that might be something that you'd be interested in looking into. Um, RTI.org, I think, is their website, and I'm not trying to promote them, um, but they do really interesting social sciences research, and, and in particular, they um, have the contract or had the contract to do these tests. Um, so the Pearls test is uh, reading literacy, the Tim's test is uh, math and science, and it's just to um, give us an idea of how we're doing relative to other countries, um, how our education system is performing, and if there are other countries that are doing better than ours, and there typically are, um, what are they doing differently uh, that, than we're doing, and what can we learn from them? Uh, what can we take from that? How can we improve our own education system um, based on what we, what we can see on those results? So that's why I think it's important to know um, what those tests are. And every four years or so, when a new set of results, statistical results, um, come out, um, it usually makes the news and people talk about where the United States ranks, which you know, I think can be important. Um, but what's more important is uh, what are the other countries doing and what are we doing and are we improving? Um, and if we're not improving, um, what might account for that and how can we, uh, how can we address that? Um, and then the last thing in this chapter, um, intelligence. Um, the, uh, there are many theories of intelligence. One of the thorny problems with intelligence is defining what it is. Um, I had um, students ask me, what's the difference between an achievement test and an aptitude test? Um, an aptitude test purports to uh, test uh, a child's ability. Um, so if I give you a test in this class, I'm testing your achievement. I'm testing what you have achieved, what you have learned in this class. If I was testing your aptitude, I would be testing your ability to learn the material in this class. And I have no idea how to do that. Uh, I don't know how I would be able to tell what your ability is. I know what your performance is, um, and I know um, things that can that can help students typically, um, but what I don't know is any, uh, any really reliable way um, to measure ability. That's one of the thorny problems with intelligence tests. When you take an IQ test, um, there are, you know, it is a ch partly achievement because if you don't know, if you know the answer, then you've learned that somewhere. And so in that sense, it's an achievement test. Um, if it's things like spatial rotation or mental rotation or logic or speed of processing, um, some of those things um, seem to be more automatic, um, but still a familiarity with test taking is going to influence how well you do on that test. So. In that sense, it's still an achievement test, and that's one of the problems um, that that uh, that uh, psychometricians grapple with. Okay, um, so um, Spearman's G, the idea that um, there's a general uh, intelligence that that people have a certain amount of, 
um, and that pervades everything that they do. And if they decide to be a, a professional basketball player, if they decide to be a dancer, if they decide to be a astrophysicist or a neuroscientist, um, they are using their general intelligence in that way. And had they used it in another way, they would have also excelled in something else. So that's Spearman's theory. Uh, uh, Gardner's theory is the idea of multiple intelligences, and you probably learned about that in introductory psychology, and you can you know, review what each of those are. But that was the idea that there are all these different categories of intelligence, and we all have some of all of them, but we might be higher in some and, and not in others. You know, perhaps Shakespeare might be higher in language, uh, Mozart higher in musical abilities. So, um, so uh, Gardner had an idea that that these uh, were separate constructs. Um, in a future chapter, we'll be talking about Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence. So, um, hold, you know, hold on until we get to the exam review for that. Um, that comes up in middle adulthood. And um, then the last thing is the Flynn effect. Um, the idea that each generation is almost a standard deviation higher in IQ than the previous generation. So what that means is, in a practical sense, you are two standard deviations above your grandparents, meaning that if you're the norm, your grandparents are functionally, intellectually disabled. Um, and that's a hard thing to swallow because you don't probably, if you know your grandparents or knew your grandparents, you probably don't think of them as intellectually disabled unless they were. Um, and so what accounts for that? You know, that everybody, that ev in every generation, this average is moving higher. Um, well, a lot of things are changing. Education is changing, nutrition is changing, the environment is changing, expectations are changing, access to technology is changing. Um, things are getting better in an educational sense. And so people are getting smarter. Um, there's this idea that um, Jean, Jean Twenge wrote a book called, I think it's called The Me Generation, or Generation Me, one of the two, um, where she talked about um, the idea that um, the younger, that the millennials um, think they're so much smarter than everybody else. And uh, I always take a step back when I hear references to that book. It's like, well, because they are smarter. Um, you know, statistically, they're, you know, each generation is getting smarter. So um, when people criticize younger people and say, oh, you know, they're narcissistic, they're, they think they're so smart, it's like, well, they, they kind of are. So, uh, so there's something to that. All right. Um, chapter eight, psychosocial development um, in childhood. Um, Erickson's stage uh, at this time is uh, industry versus inferiority. Um, I've said this before, I, I feel like these stages of Erickson's, um, at, you know, there was trust versus mistrust, and then the next three kind of clump together on a, on a common theme, and the theme is industry, autonomy, the child being uh, directing their own uh, desires and trying things out. Um, and if they're able to do that and they feel good about it, then they resolve that crisis in a positive way. Um, if they don't, then they um, have feelings of inferiority, shame, doubt, those kinds of things. And so um, Erickson really thought that we should allow children to try everything. Um, and that was a really important part of development, being able to try these things. Um, Self-concept and self-esteem, very similar concepts. Self-concept is how children describe themselves. Uh, I'm tall. I'm I'm good at baseball. I'm, you know, things that are observable and actually verifiable. Um, Self-esteem, on the other hand, is how you feel about those things. It's your evaluative judgment about that. So you could say, I'm a dancer. I'm, you know, a certain size. I'm a good uh, student. I'm well liked by my friends. Um, those are all uh, evaluative comments. Uh, not evaluative. Those are all factual um, and uh, and can be verified. Um, but how, you, how that makes you feel. Um, so what do I think of myself? What is my sense of self-worth? Um, that is self-esteem. Um, the role of resilience. Um, children are quite resilient to a variety of things. And so um, it's no surprise to you that children grow up in risky environments. Um, some do, some don't. Um, and some of those children are resilient um, and still succeed. And other ones are less resilient and struggle. Um, and so there are factors that support resilience. Um, some of the protective factors are, in the face of risk, are things like having the presence of an adult in your life that can help you, that cares about you. It could be a coach, it could be a librarian, it could be a mentor, it could be a teacher, it could be a parent, grandparent. Um, having a consistent person in your life is one of the most important protective factors uh, for children um, at this age. Um, Okay, um, shared and non-shared environments. Um, a lot, you know, we're always trying to figure out how much matters. Does parenting matter? Um, what matters? Um, is, it all, is it all biological and genetic? Do the parents matter at all? Um, and so one of the ways that we do this is we study shared and non-shared environments and see how it influences children. Um, you may have a sibling or have known siblings um, who grew up in the same household and turned out very differently. Um, and so they'll, they'll ask themselves sometimes, 
you know, why is it that you're so different from me? And why do you remember things so differently from how we grew up? We were in the same house. Like, you know, things should have been the same. We should be more alike. Um, and the answer to that is that um, temperament and personality will influence what you, how you will experience any given situation. So a shy child and an outgoing child will experience, say, a family get together in very different ways. Um, and uh, it's not to say one is better or more accurate than the other, but it's a different experience for them. If you're shy and you are feeling overwhelmed, that's a different experience for you than the extroverted, um, sort of more sociable child who um, feels, you know, like they want to be the center of attention and is the center of attention. So. Um, those kinds of experiences over the long haul add up to a very different home environment, for example. Um, and so even though it purports to be a shared environment, in some sense, it's not completely shared. Uh, family structures um, and how they impact family functioning, I think is well described in the textbook, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, they, most of them are exactly what they sound like. Um, and then peer influences. Um, children are influenced almost as much by their peers as they are by their parents at this age. So they spend a lot of time with their peers. Um, sociometrics and psychometrics um, will go into are the, are the study of um, how these things play out, um, who's popular, who's not, um, who's being bullied, who's not. Um, uh, one thing that I'll point out on bullying is that the most effective strategy to counteract bullying in schools is a whole school strategy. And a whole school strategy, if you're interested in the research on this, I'll be glad to send you some of the articles. A whole school strategy um, involves parents, children, teachers, administrators, um, everybody is involved and everybody has a piece of it and everybody's working together. So they've got a shared vision um, and there are um, ground rules and everybody is participating in some way. So that whole school approach is much more effective than trying to deal you know, one at a time with the bullies, with the victims, um, and, and separating them out and individualizing them that way. So um, just keep that in mind. And again, if you'd like any of that research, bullying is a, uh, is a big problem. Um, and so the people that are experiencing it or have children that are experiencing it um, will be people who will probably want to um, do a deeper dive into that research. Um, and then lastly, Kohlberg's stages of moral reasoning and how they differ, um, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. When you think about pre-conventional reasoning, it really is just about rewards and punishments. If there's anything that uh, suggests that the person is concerned with how they will appear to others, that's conventional reasoning. So pre-conventional reasoning is, you know, will I get in trouble, will I be punished, or will I get a reward? Um, and not, how will those people think of me, and then they want to give me a reward. Conventional reasoning is, how will those people think of me, how will I be perceived by strangers, peers, um, teachers, whoever notices what I'm doing, um, that would be conventional reasoning. So an example that I use a lot is um, parking and handicap parking. Um, the reason that you won't do it uh, or that you would do it, Kohlberg again didn't care whether you said you would do this thing or not do this thing, he wanted to know why. And so it's the quality of the reasoning and not the answer that you get to. Um, if you um, say, you know, I wouldn't park in um, handicap parking because I might get a ticket, that's pre-conventional reasoning. If you say I wouldn't park there because other people need it and if somebody saw me I would be embarrassed, that's conventional reasoning. Um, Post-conventional reasoning really is no longer talking about parking or tickets or, or you, um, it's just sort of how does the world work or how should the world work in an ideal sense. Um, and we rarely do that. Like I don't know if you sit in your car and think, I wonder what the world would be like if nobody took care of other people. Um, what you're really thinking about is, uh, you know, what would the situation be like if somebody in your town needed that parking place at the time that you were in it, and that's conventional reasoning. Post-conventional reasoning, a much higher level. Okay, um, chapter nine, um, beginning of adolescence, um, so formal operational thinking. Um, now children are thinking, or adolescents, um, they don't like to be called children, uh, are thinking uh, using abstract reasoning. And they're using logic, um, and they're trying to, they're understanding that there's an ideal um, and a reality, and they're finding these things relatively separate. And so they can be quite critical and argumentative in a way that they haven't been before. Um, so when you're thinking about formal op uh, operational reasoning, think about um, them doing if-then. Like, well, what if we did it this way? Or what if we did it that way? Or why do we do this? 
um, and not so much that's not fair, um, like the, the co concrete operational thinker. Um, in this case, it's trying to, uh, to reason through an argument. Um, so hypothetical thinking, if then, if we do it this way, then what would happen? Um, if I can, um, you know, if I'm old enough to do this, why am I not old enough to do this other thing? Um, that, would be, um, that would be formal operational thinking. Um, Elkind's research um, and, uh, and work um, identified a number of uh, terms for uh, things that we typically see adolescents doing. Um, personal fable, the invincibility fable, um, uh, imaginary audience, those kinds of things. Um, so um, just, you know, it's just a different experience. They're much more aware of themselves and they're trying to figure out who they are. Um, and uh, they're, they're trying to work through these things. Um, inductive and deductive reasoning is something that they can do now. They can reason from the bottom up. They can reason from the top down. You know, if this is what it looks like, well then it must have these other qualities, or if it's got all of these qualities, it must be this thing. Um, so different ways of reasoning, just, you know, more complex. You know, it's a more, uh, it's a more complex uh, view of, cognit of cognition at this age. Um, entity and incremental theories of, of uh, intelligence. This is the research of Carol Dweck um, on fixed and growth mindsets. Um, a fixed mindset is an entity theory, and it's the idea that you have a certain amount of intelligence, and once you've reached some level and things get hard, then you must be done. Like that must be how good you are at math or how good you are at writing. Um, and then for the rest of your life, it's like, well, you know, I got this far, but but I didn't go any farther because I wasn't smart enough, right? You know, I didn't have enough intelligence. That's the entity theory. The incremental theory is that uh, intelligence grows in increments, um, and that if you, uh, my, Carol Dweck's favorite word, I think, is yet. You haven't learned it yet. You haven't mastered it yet. You could master it if you spent more time at it. Um, and that's probably true of almost everything you've ever said to yourself, I'm not good at that and I'm gonna stop doing it. It could be drawing, it could be, uh, math is a, is a common one. Um, if you spent more time at it, you would get better at it, um, and and you know that. Um, but it might not be fun, uh, and and it makes us feel bad when we fail. Um, and so a lot of times people will stop doing things. But if they kept going, from Dweck's research and from Dweck's theory, um, they would learn more. And so when you think about intelligence that way, it's something that continually grows throughout throughout the lifespan. Um, okay, I think that's the end for um, chapter nine. So that was chapters seven, eight, and nine, and the next session we'll talk about chapters 10, 11, and 12. So I hope this was helpful, um, and uh, if you've got questions, let me know. Thanks.